Claire? Thank you so much, Elspeth. And um, I just want to say it's 12.06, and we were supposed to start lunch in about 10 minutes, and that's not going to happen. Okay. All right. Just want to let you know. Okay. Um, so I also want to say what a privilege it is to be here in the room with so many people I've learned from. Um, Ira um, was part of a pro seminar in the state that I was in when I was a graduate student, which totally changed my life. Um, Elżbieta took me to Poland, from which I have never entirely returned, um, and that changed my life. And Jeff, who invited me into his project at Public Seminar um, and initiated actually one of the best collaborations I've ever had. Um, somehow he intuited that we were the same um, and different at the same time. So as I watched the battle over the future of Twitter unroll in the past several weeks, the only thing all users agreed on was that libertarian Elon Musk's purchase of the platform meant that chaos was imminent. One phrase, I can't believe you said that, kept recurring in right-wing threads, many of which looked forward to the social media platform returning to a state of nature that many imagined it had fallen from since its birth in 2006. Even though Twitter is not particularly well moderated and never has been, liberals and leftists were dismayed by this possibility. Some announcing that they would have to delete their accounts immediately when the platform inevitably veered sharply toward its function as a totalitarian megaphone. Right-wing trolls imagined this chaos as a victory. Speech would be liberated, they said, and Twitter would finally realize its democratic potential as a, as a platform for free speech. Extremist pundits and ordinary MAGA foot soldiers alike flooded Twitter with images of the left or the libs weeping inconsolably or melting down at the thought of Twitter's admittedly feeble moderation practices. Particularly pointed forms of humiliation were rewarded with the phrase, I can't believe you said that. Those of us who came of age as so-called public intellectuals on the internet watched these performances with amusement. Social media is now a form of politics and a metric among populists in particular, both conservative and, and left populists for the health of freedom in the larger society, which is a little scary. I started writing my first blog in 2006, about six months after Twitter launched and the same year that Jeff Goldfarb published The Politics of Small Things, The Power of the Powerless in Dark Times. Then Twitter was understood as a form of blogging that could be performed on Apple's new iPhone. First described as a microblogging platform, tweets were half the length they were today, and its founders imagined it as a tool, not for conversation, ideas, and news, which it has become, but for finding one's friends on Saturday night. The original name, killed by marketing for its creepy overtones, was Friend Stalker. <laughs> but what I noticed in last week's Twitter fracas was the repurposing of the phrase, I can't believe you said that. Rather than signaling the perfection of cruelty or an epic dose of schadenfreude, in the old blogging world, that phrase recognized that the blogger had revealed a previously hidden truth and thus opened a new conversational space that evaded the silences and repression of ordinary academic life. Yes, the phrase could be, a pra could be praised for delivering the perfect zinger to a troll in the comments section, but normally it was a reward for a post that trod all over the sacred cows of the university. It not only expressed admiration, but it signaled that the writer being praised had extended the range of what could be said about the real or meat world that one's corner of the blogosphere mirrored. As opposed to what I would say is Twitter's essentially totalitarian character, and I'll get back to that, blogs were essentially democratic in their design and purposes, not because they promoted radically free speech, but because they revealed possibilities for new conversations. They became a gateway between the academy and the non-academic world. And they provided respite from a university life that also, I would argue, harbors the potential for totalitarian forms of discipline. Indeed, we bloggers spent our days as obedient university citizens and our nights 
even our office hours, contesting the terms and conditions of our day jobs. Later on, many of us became identified as a new generation of public intellectuals, but that wasn't strictly true. Many of us became public intellectuals on far more conventional platforms later, the ones that had always hosted such people when our blogging was actually discovered by editors in the non-academic non world. In reality though, there was only a few of us who actually made this transition. Many bloggers simply quit posting at some point and melted back into their institutions. For those of us who persevered, blogging was a stage on the way to a publishing world that was undergoing convulsions because of the internet. As bloggers, we weren't public intellectuals. We were intellectuals in search of a public and in resistance against the narrow discipline of university life and the disapproval of our colleagues. As such, we bloggers were a people in search of a democracy as well and democratic freedoms that we didn't find in ordinary academic work. We were in flight from constraint and discipline, however collegial and well-rewarded it was. We were in resistance to the totalitarian impulses of a higher education industry that disavowed such impulses at the same time as it enforced them relentlessly. In response, we created a digital backstage for our readers who were not actually the public, but in fact, a counter public as Jorgen Habermas would have it, almost entirely made up of other academics. In fact, some of us who were pseudonymous, a state that we pompously likened to the anonymous pamphleteers of the revolutionary 18th century, usually discovered at some point or another to our shock and horror that one of our main audiences was our own institutional colleagues who regarded us as some fascinating and horrible version of Evelyn Waugh's Daily Beast. <laughs> but I think that something that academic blogging accomplished other than eventually making some of us into the general audience writers we wanted to be, was to activate blogging itself as a democratic space within higher education, expanding what could be said in universities and who it could be said to. We did this by actually writing down things that everyone knew were constitutive of university life and that everyone talked about, but that were too dangerous to discuss openly on campus. Sexual harassment was a big topic, class another. In a larger sense, we were interested in the various forms of intellectual and social terror that have kept university hierarchies relatively intact over time, an invisible and institutionalized terror that intensified as the job market narrowed and employment became more tenuous. Blog posts often consisted of a simple structure. This happened, this is what it means. In the policy world, such disruptive speech acts are said to expand what is known as the Overton window, which theorizes the process by which new ideas actually come to affect politics over time and make things seem possible. The Overton window argues that politicians can only pursue ideas that are broadly consented to or broadly recognized. To expand the boundaries of policy consensus, society has to evolve incrementally or as we have seen in the last five years of American history, be jolted by those who break the rules with impunity. In short, academic bloggers spent a lot of time trying to rectify what we saw as unfair about the institutions that paid our salaries and supported our aspirations. It was a paradoxical enterprise. The subject was the totalitarian impulses that I would argue are imminent, not just in universities, but in all institutions. Our method was shining what light we could on the messier world that lurked behind the veil of academic respectability and that constrained both our social and our intellectual lives. Looking back on it, the jolts we gave to the system were rarely seismic, but in the context of academic politesse, they mattered because the undiscussable suddenly became discussable. For example, an adjunct wrote about the conditions of her own labor, which invited other adjuncts into her comments section to log their experiences. And I would say the visibility of adjuncts is directly tied to blogging. A distinguished pseudonymous English professor blogged about her polyamorous private life. She had at least three girlfriends. A young, barely tenured early American historian who famously called the most senior person it, 
who famously called the most senior person in her field a misogynist who routinely wrote disparaging reviews of books written by prestigious women, but who was hated equally by both genders, she called him a tool in public. Now, it's hard to understand when worse things happen on Twitter every second, how influential this moment was among historians. As very senior men raged in the bloggers' comments section using their own names, and female and male commenters used pseudonymous accounts to say to the blogger admiringly, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> the Overton window of forced deference opened just a little bit wider and a sweet breeze blew through it. These things happened long before any of us who were blogging imagined calling ourselves public intellectuals. We were highly educated people after all, and we knew the difference between our self-edited often quarrelsome platforms and the highly curated little magazines that had served as platforms for a range of Cold War academics, from Hannah Arendt to Frank Friedel, Lionel Trilling, and Irving Kristol. Here again, it is important that most of us did not write under our real names, at least initially, and public intellectuals do. That's what makes them pub public. Although none of us really understood it at the time, many of us, and particularly those of us who are untenured or not yet full professors, um, perceived universities as totalitarian, lacking, as Jeff Goldfarb points out in his reading of Hannah Arendt in The Politics of Small Things, the public space where those of us who had a bone to pick with academic life could express or fully be our authentic selves. For academic bloggers then, the internet was our kitchen table, our clandestine bookstore, our basement theatricals and living room literary salons. They were a small and far less significant analogy, in short, to the alternative public spaces where Jeff saw the social bonds, ideas and energy amassing in Poland as a democratic society began to emerge there after decades of Soviet style dictatorship. Now, I don't want to make academic blogging sound more important than it was. It certainly was a drop in the bucket compared to the collapse and replacement of an entire media industry and political system, both of which we have experienced in the last 20 years. And in fact, academic blogging never overthrew anything. We never came close to changing how universities work. The dreadful labor intensive way that people are hired, the scourge of adjunctification or governance structures that have become less rather than more inclusive over time. Racism and sexual harassment continue to be endemic problems, as does the horrible anxiety that young people suffer as they make their way from promotion to promotion, smiling courteously, courteously at we senior faculty for years and going home to grind their teeth at night. It's probably okay we didn't change everything, or rather it remains to be seen whether that is okay, at a moment when the financial model for all but a sliver of well-financed private colleges and universities are failing to meet the economic needs of most students and many of their employees. But academic bloggers did do one thing, I think, which was to nurture an alternative public sphere where vast numbers of us learn to write, not for the purpose of being evaluated by others, but for ourselves. We learn to turn our research and critical thinking skills to contemporary problems and tell stories to ordinary people. And because of that, many of us who had not been trained to function outside the university were able to combine the intellects we had honed in these totalitarian university spaces with those that we perfected in our democratic blog spaces and toggle back and forth between the two. Through political arguments and debates on the internet, the everyday interactions that Jeff explores in the politics of small things, um, because of that, by 2016, we were prepared to raise our voices and grapple with the rise of a liberal democracy in the United States itself. There are people who have always and remain skeptical about the possibilities the digital sphere holds for intellectual and political work. And those possibilities were eventually realized on Facebook and even more so on Twitter. And one of the things I hope I have impressed upon you so far is if if there are small spaces where democracy can flourish under totalitarianism, there are spaces for totalitarianism that are also carved out in spaces like universities that have been built for democracy. And Twitter, I would argue, is a perfect example of one of those spaces, more like radio, as Jeff characterizes that medium in the politics of small things than like the internet, I think it is worth noting that Jeff began writing about the internet in 2006, 
um, right before the platforms that would drive the illiberal impulses in our political culture began to characterize the internet, right? So in a revision, Jeff, you need to go back to that. Yeah. Um, so all, all of this illiberalism has really crested in the last month on Twitter because of the Musk proffer. Um, Twitter has been blowing up in ways that Twitter likes best, exchanging incendiary, incendiary opinions about itself. Anxiety on the left and the glee among a variety of American conservatives who believe that all moderation is censorship escalated in the next several weeks. Musk turned down the board seat only to declare that he wanted to buy the whole company and take it private, signing that agreement earlier this week for $44 billion. Thousands of liberal and left-wing users caused the hashtag, hashtag leaving Twitter to trend. Shortly thereafter, conservatives jumped in using the same hashtag to troll the left, as they call everyone who isn't them, with images of coffee mugs labeled refill with liberal tears, weeping emojis, and large dump trucks disposing of hundreds of little figures, faces tipped to the sky and tears pouring out of their tiny eyes. I want to stipulate that I have no stake in this particular quarrel. I don't care who owns Twitter or Facebook or any other platform, and I'm fairly sure that the only thing that will change any of them, for better or for worse, is government regulation of the kind that the European Union and Australia are beginning to implement. What I'm much more interested in is what all of these partisans are really arguing about, which is an idea that has persisted since the 1990s that the internet and the various platforms that make it usable or accessible by a mass audience is a public square that is subject to rights claims. As The Economist editorialized, compared with its rivals, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, Twitter is a minnow. Twitter's size belies it, its importance, however. As a haunt of politicians, pundits, and wonks, it does much to set the political weather, a digital public square, as Mr. Musk put it. There's a great deal invested in this idea of the internet as public square because no other media, medium other than the editable web, short of standing on a box in Union Square declaiming to an assembled crowd, has ever had this quality. As a quick search of the phrase public square turns up thousands of tweets characterizing Twitter in this way that were generated in the last week alone. To me, this validates the perception that Twitter, like blogging, represents a valuable intellectual commons, um, one that's importance goes well beyond what Musk and The Economist have to say about it. As Molly Jong Fast, a journalist who writes for liberal and centrist publications like The Atlantic and The Bulwark tweeted, I don't understand liberals leaving Twitter because they're mad about Elon Musk. For now, and this might not always be true forever, this is the public square, why cede it? I can't believe she said that. But what these exchanges also reveal is that the question of the internet as a democratic public space requires revision to take account of new circumstances and the conversation about digital public space as a poten potentially totalitarian institution, sorry, um, a potentially totalitarian institution, I That's lost my place. Okay. <laughs> I'm two senses that works against the interests of public intellectual life is radically underdeveloped. This is why, for example, conversations about so called cancel culture are so incoherent. Whether we all agree on what exactly the digital public square is, how it should or should not be governed, what it means to behave or misbehave in it, or what the consequences should be for violating a range of standards that otherwise apply in real life. This has yet to be determined, and that is the project that is now before us.